Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, welcome, welcome, everyone. We can see the the, um, the crowd is filling up. Thank you, everyone, for uh, attending this, the last in our current series of webinars. Uh, my name's Corey Watts. I'm policy advisor to FCA, amongst other things, and um, I I'm really happy that we're getting so many different people uh, to these to these webinars, and today. As with, with most of them, we've got um, quite a, a broad cross-section of folk from agricultural leaders, farmers, uh, uh, folk working in state and federal governments and um, industry consultants and, and others as well. It's really wonderful to have you here and everyone is welcome. Um, I'm really looking forward to this particular, um, I've looked forward to all of them, but I'm looking forward to this particular webinar. We have some two wonderful speakers. Uh, who I will briefly introduce now um, before handing over to Wendy Cohen, our CEO. Um, oh, but, but first, let me do some housekeeping. Um, please turn off your, your video unless um, uh, you're speaking. Um, otherwise, we'll turn it off for you. Uh, please use Slido, hashtag Regional Horizons P3, uh, in preference to the Zoom chat for your questions and comments. And we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. Um, so first up, we have Associate Professor Lauren Ricketts. Uh, Lauren is a longtime friend and a wonderful um, source of advice and wisdom. Uh, Lauren's a, a rural sociologist and she's co-leader of the Climate Change and Resilience Research Program at the Center for Urban Research um, at RMIT University, but don't let the urban fool you. Um, she's got a very strong background in in um, rural social research. So it's, it's wonderful to have Lauren here. And then after Lauren, we'll have um, Cam Nicholson, who uh, describes himself rather humbly, I think, as um, a farmer and, and consultant out near Geelong. But uh, I think you'll find that uh, uh, while those are wonderful occupations, um, he, he is above and beyond uh, and will give you some really good advice. So, um, before they speak, over to you, Wendy. Wonderful, thank you so much, Corey. Uh, we're just so lucky to have you, Corey, helping us with this, advising us, and helping us to really unpack regional horizons. Um, uh, so I really value the work that you've been providing us. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to this third session of Farmers for Climate Action's Regional Horizon Summit. Um, I'd like to acknowledge firstly the traditional, traditional custodians of the land on which I live in Canberra, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects uh, to their leaders past, present and future. Before we move on to the wonderful presentations from Lauren and, and Cam that Corey's uh, introduced, um, and I'm really thrilled to have Lauren and Cam with us today, um, I'd just like to uh, thank the incredible team of FCA for their work in bringing regional horizons to life. They're such an inspiring group of people to work with. And I'd also like to thank the FCA board members uh, and those particularly who are joining us today. They've been really fierce champions of regional horizons and of course, incredible advocates for farming communities and, and the need for us all to take climate action in support of those communities. I'd also uh, would like to acknowledge those very important donors who have been taking the journey of Regional Horizons with us since we launched two months ago. We're so grateful for your commitment to FCA and to farmers across the country. Our ability to influence the hearts and minds through farmer-led solutions is so much greater for your ongoing support. When I came to uh, FCA uh, last September, I was blown away by the energy and the drive of farmers to make a difference and lead through an evidence base the fight against the devastating effects of climate change. A, a year later almost, I'm just as inspired as ever by our farmers and also the brilliant researchers, scientists and agricultural leaders that we work with. And I hope that like me, you're seeing the progress that we're making together towards a low carbon future and the limiting of temperature increases globally. Regional Horizons began as a recovery program, a stimulus ask, if you like, through the pandemic for rural and regional Australia with farmers at its core, their needs, their experience and their know-how. And now it's grown into a, a roadmap for supporting communities to implement on-farm solutions, 
lead innovation and investment for low emissions and clean energy future and build resilience and mitigation capacity across the country. I'm so proud of Regional Horizons and really excited to see where it will take us. Before I hand back to Corey, uh, I did want to reflect on a significant win for Australia, for farmers, for agriculture and for the entire country recently. As you may know, the National Farmers Federation has now adopted its climate change policy, which commits to an economy-wide zero net emissions target by 2050. It's a great outcome and with the strong support of its members, it signals a unified approach across agriculture to bring our industry into line with other sectors and commit to working together to address climate change. FCA is really pleased to have played its part in making this happen. So I can't wait to hear from Lauren and Cam today. We're really privileged to call them part of the FCA family. And I know you'll take a great deal from their presentations today. Back to you, Corey. Thank you. Thanks so much, Wendy. And yes, that, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. That is quite a win. Um, you know, I've been working in this arena for a long time and boy, that's a big shift and, and well done to NFF and all the crew. Um, so without further ado, Lauren, Lauren is going to talk Corey. To you about, <laughs> <laughs> we're, going, we're going from the farm out to the community and back again, which is sort of the way we do things at FCA. So I'm really keen to hear from you, Lauren, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Corey. And thank you, Wendy, for that kind introduction. Um, it's an absolute honor to be able to work uh, with Farmers for Climate Action, uh, who are really just cutting edge in so many different ways, including the way they go about doing things as well as, as, as what you're doing as well. So look, I just, I've got a short presentation, but I'm really keen to um, primarily be discussing things with people. So uh, let me take you through this. Can I just get some confirmation that we are not seeing that screen? We can Great. see the screen, yep. That's Terrific, all right. So I just wanted to um, discuss a few things about resilience, which you know is a, is a topic that is um, often discussed, but in little bubbles where the conversations would be almost unrecognisable if you were to be a fly in a wall, <laughs> the different ones. Uh, but focusing on, uh, where is it gonna go down? Uh, yeah. Focusing on some of the sort of key elements that uh, I've been engaging with, through work uh, that goes back a long while, uh, the privilege of working with Birchett Cropping Group um, as their thinker in residence and then a social researcher, uh, through to current day work I'm doing with the Victorian government and others. Uh, I just wanted to focus on a few things that are really sort of coming to the fore uh, as I work across those different scales, as well as I should mention work with the IPCC, um, lucky to be one of the lead authors for the Austral Asia chapter. Uh, and lucky, a little bit fatigued. We've got actually a, a conference going on at the moment, which involves Australians attending meetings at midnight uh, through till 2 a.m. So <laughs> if I nod off, just give me a prod. Um, so even at that global scale, uh, resilience is being discussed. So it's sort of this uh, attempt to kind of connect a few key elements of it. One of them is this question of the politics of it. And it's difficult to start a talk uh, about resilience these days uh, without kind of bringing this to the fore. And as this uh, sign um, from New Orleans following Hurricane Katrina makes so clear, resilience is a term that is often uh, misused, even abused. And we need to be very careful in how we go about talking about it. Because if resilience is uh, kind of, you know, some people interpret it a kind of suck it up type message, uh, then there's a lot of questions about what it is that people are being asked to be resilient to uh, and who is being asked to be resilient and looking at who is actually doing that sort of asking. So when we start to do this, we start to uh, develop the critical thinking skills and the systemic thinking skills uh, that we need to ask the hard questions before we run off and practice being resilient. And I think that's part of the really uh, important work that FCA can do is start to connect the dots and start to ask really, really hard questions. And when we're talking about climate change and being resilient to climate change impacts, 
then of course all of that has to be prefaced on the very important need to reduce that climate change in the first place. So that's the sort of first message is just to say that this is not at all what some people um, do criticise adaptation and resilience uh, conversations to be, which is a kind of um, defeatist attitude on climate change. Uh, this is a smart um, and intelligent way of approaching it uh, that takes into account the need to reduce the stresses that anyone or anything is being asked to be resilient to. And we'll go through that a little bit more. This, uh, I think, is actually something that, you know, farmers and rural communities are very much experts in. They're not just experts in uh, the kind of doing of resilience, that whole sort of uh, sometimes mystique that comes with that stoicism that's uh, very much part of the Australian folklore but also the awareness that there are limits to the kind of intelligence of that. And these are some quotes from uh, some farmers, uh, mostly in the sort of, you can see that the, this is my, straight out of the report I did for Critical Breaking Point for Birchip Cropping Group. Uh, it gives you an indication there of the gender and the age of the farmers. Uh, and you can see there that there's already a highly developed critical attention to the limitations of an of a habitual and unthinking approach to resilience. Uh, and uh, this kind of idea that if you do it uh, in an unthinking way, it doesn't look dissimilar from stupidity. <laughs> and as you know, the farmers are saying here, you know, I, I can say this being in the farming family, you know, sometimes you say this is ridiculous. So this is, I guess, just to say that resilience is not an excuse for not thinking. It's not a kind of boxing ring type thing about who just can jump up. Uh, the, the, the most. And one of the really um, important things about this work that I was uh, able to do with Birchip Cropping Group, uh, and I should say that one of the innovative things here was this, this was their first foray into social research, uh, was that it was able to start, um, I guess, celebrating, if you like, bringing to the fore this sort of critical thinking to cut through, this was during the millennium drought, cut through some of the, um, some of the romanticism, some of the expectations to actually start having the more difficult questions. And that's how we start to connect drought and climate change. That's how we start to actually get to the sort of adaptation, climate change adaptation that we actually need. So, Sometimes when people look at that and they look at the politics of resilience and they look at the limitations and um, they, you know, get hot under the collar about different approaches to drought and drought support, for example, then there's a sort of sense that, you know, resilience is not kind of, you know, something we should talk about, that we should sort of move on from it and that everything should be, you know, for example, about a word that's frequently in my space around transformation. But I actually resist that. I think we actually need to actually get better at both. I think we need to get better at resilience and we need to get better at transformational adaptation and adapt, um, broader transformations as well. And that's because it's absolutely undeniable now that the kind of severe acute disruptions that resilience is most often uh, discussed in relation to are increasing. And this is the kind of uh, bifocal glasses that uh, climate change requires us to put on, is that we have to see not just further into the future and look hard at those long-term trajectories and think, therefore, what we need to do to reduce those, the mitigation part, but we also need to get far better at understanding variability and to responding to variability. And we don't need to look far around the world to understand this is not just about the short list of typical climatic hazards in Australia either. You know, we're talking about a more volatile, a more disrupted world. And the fact that I'm talking to you from lockdown Melbourne uh, just points to uh, the kind of unusual and unprecedented uh, disruptions uh, that the world is now suffering, you know, aka okay, um, COVID-19. But, you know, it could be the economic volatility we point to, or it could be the big questions around earth system volatility and earth system tipping points, as this paper in Nature discusses, where you've got feedbacks happening between the, uh, the biosphere and the hydrosphere, the cryosphere, the oceans, etc., which are far, far more complex than we've appreciated until recently. And those tipping points have cascading impacts. 
So if we look now at a recent IPCC report that came out last year, and I should say that this theme is absolutely um, fundamental to the current IPCC work that we're working on, we're looking now at how to deal with multiple hazards, compound risk, so that's the kind of one, two, or the additional, uh, the uh, multiplying effect of experiencing things at the one time, and the very, very complex cascading impacts. And you'll be pleased to know that this is even before the fires, uh, Australia was considered the poster child of compound risk and cascading impacts. And in this particular uh, IPCC report about the, the world, you know, it's global level, uh, featured Tasmania actually from the summer of 2015, 2016 as an example of when multiple things happen and the cascading effects of that. And that involved things like the drought combining with the um, overuse and degradation of the bass link causing blackouts, which couldn't be fixed because of the storms and, you know, double pressures on emergency services with floods at one end of the state, fires in the top end of the state combined with a marine heat wave. So it's just a kind of example of the way that we need to actually, um, yes, we might be dissatisfied um, with kind of the single hazard resilience model and, and feel like we need to push back against that, but we actually need to appreciate that we need to do resilience better, not uh, just abandon the concept uh, of resilience. And so when we look at that and we put that in relation to other types of things, namely such as you know, pandemics, but any kind of zoonoses, diseases, um, people in the agricultural field will be more aware than me of all the different biosecurity risks as well. Uh, you can see the sort of complexity we have to get better at doing. So this is why when we come to the question of resilience, we actually really need to hone our skills in thinking systemically. And it always frustrates me that agriculture and farming uh, uh, systems um, and farming scholarship is not better appreciated and celebrated for the really, really important work that's already exists around systems thinking in the farming space. So we've got you know, the long legacy from the 70s of thinking around the farm system, appreciating that it's not just uh, either an individual decision maker, or it's not just an individual commodity, that it's the way these things work together. It's the farm household, it's all of the different interlocking parts. The broader farming systems, which is where you start to get into um, connecting with landscapes through social ecological systems as well. And then bringing that together with insights from resilient science about uh, all the relationships between the parts and the scales and then more recent stuff around innovation systems and different actors and knowledges. There's a lot there to build on to allow us to actually tackle those multiple hazards, those compound risks, those cascading impacts. And in work I'm doing uh, with the Victorian government at the moment, we're trying to really um, think about the farm business in the context uh, of the broader industries, but also uh, more specifically in the context of supply chains and value chains. And this is work that, um, you know, there's so much expertise in Australia around. And it really just points to the need to once again, understand things in context and understand the role of all these different groups, whether it's the input suppliers or the banks, whether it's the NRM bodies who've been doing so much work for so long working in this space, whether it's the different service providers, including the kind of different models that they uh, increasingly use uh, to reach people, uh, the industry groups uh, and groups such as uh, FCA. So all these different groups are there. And I think, you know, it's just to kind of point out the obvious, that the challenge is to actually work more closely together in a more strategic and systemic way. So they're there, but those lines do tend to be quite individual and the poor farmers are left to do the integrating work in their own heads uh, about all those different sources of advice, about all those different factors, whereas actually we need to work to a more systemic way of dealing with things. So, in that previous one, I pointed down to the arrow around processes and things, and you kind of start to get this sense of um, electricity as part of um, the important context that farm businesses are existing in. And coming back again to this question of uh, compound impacts and cascading uh, risks, uh, this was illustrated so clearly during the current fires, where not only were it 
was it the areas and the businesses and the families that were directly impacted by the fire? So this isn't just a kind of map of fire fronts. What we saw there was a real illustration of the very, very quickly spreading distance ways in which uh, these hazards can actually impact on um, all sorts of different groups. And so here, this is a, a dairy farm, uh, the coast of New South Wales, who were impacted by the fires, not through uh, the flames themselves, uh, and certainly through the smoke, but primarily because of the blackout, which meant that they were unable, they were able to milk, but they were unable to actually keep the milk. And it's that sort of impact, that sort of uh, scenario that we actually need to start getting much better at thinking about. And one of my colleagues at RMIT um, wrote about this in the conversation, just starting to point towards all of these different feedbacks and connections. So from an urban perspective, you know, the horror was that there, you know, there was no <laughs> electricity for your phones and, and the fuel and no food. And the fires could have been so much more uh, damaging and impactful uh, than they were. It was only really luck because so many people were trapped because of these questions around lack of electricity causing the, the, the um, petrol pumps not to be able to give out fuel and, and combined with the transportation uh, breakdowns. So what that meant is that we really, really need to get better at thinking through these sorts of scenarios and the feedbacks keep resonating through rural and regional communities as well. So when we start to get towards this, we need to start thinking about scenarios. So as this person's very usefully uh, graffitied on a wall, some of the most intelligent graffiti you'll see, uh, we need to start thinking about really out of the box type possible futures because that scenario that uh, unfolded with the fires as COVID-19 has similarly done, uh, really emphasizes that the unexpected needs to be increasingly expected. When we do this, we need to be very strategic in how we're doing it. So, Cam will talk to you about the kind of more specific elements of how to run your uh, run farm businesses in a, in a very intelligent, strategic manner. My approach here is just simply to point out the very um, important need to think about these different futures uh, and to think about the, the possibilities. Now, I've been emphasising some pretty uh, kind of dark kind of futures, but I think it's important to note the black arrow here pointing to the preferable future because this is just as important. This is about the sort of vision that's laid out in the Regional Horizons document. This is about the idea of saying, well, actually, we're not going to take climate change. We're actually going to fight against that because we don't want those dark futures. So we need to combine in our minds all the time this dark possible futures, but also work together towards the preferable futures. And that means uh, addressing uh, climate change adaptation in a way that takes into account uh, the systemic problems that already exist. To think about how we can use adaptation for co-benefits, how can we can use adaptation to actually make things better in the first place. And one of the ways that I always try to explain climate change uh, impacts is as a kind of uh, sandwich, if you like, where they don't sort of fall from the sky, but though any particular climatic hazard and the biophysical effects always are interacting with existing vulnerabilities. So those existing vulnerabilities are where adaptation needs to focus as much as reducing the risks of those particular climatic hazards. Oh, sorry, that slide's gone a bit bizarre, but um, this was simply to say that when we look at existing vulnerabilities, we need to think about how well our existing systems are performing. Some of them are too rigid. And we can all uh, think of particular, usually IT and bureaucracy based uh, examples of that, where there's just a lack of flexibility and makes for ridiculous outcomes. Uh, but then some are also too loose. There's just simply a lack of connection. And thinking back to the challenge of linking all those different groups within just agricultural supply and value chains together, you can see the need to actually perhaps tighten up some of those systems. And part of it is also about how we think that systemic thing, and that's about learning for, to uh, think about the scenarios, learning to think about probable and preferable futures. So to end, I just wanted to emphasize that this means that resilience needs to evolve to be a much more shared endeavor. And Again, there's so many seeds uh, to grow here. There's so many uh, existing elements within the Australian farming system um, 
world to really build on. And having done some work for ACR over the last couple of years and been able to sort of look across what's happening in some other places, there really are some very, very unique and positive uh, elements of the Australian agricultural scene that we need to build on. Landcare being one of them, it's you know, exported now around the world, but that approach of farmer groups, of learning together through networks of a learning oriented approach uh, is absolutely what we need to revive. So this isn't about reinventing things. We don't have to completely start afresh. What we do need to do is think about how repurposing them. And in a sense, that's the essence of resi resilience is to be resourceful. Look about what we have. Um, I'll skip over that because it's a bit boring. Uh, but just to kind of finish off to say that regional horizons to me is not only a really, really set uh, important set of policy um, directions. It offers the, that preferable future, it offers real practical solutions, including the idea of the uh, regional resilience hubs. But it's also the way it brings people together like we're here to get today, which is that cutting edge approach that we need to cultivate. Okay, I'll leave it there, thanks. Oh, I was on mute. Thanks, Lauren. That was wonderful, as, as always. Um, <laughs> as always, I learned something new. Um, I picked up some, oh gosh, there's so much that sticks in my mind there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I love the bifocal glasses, by the way. I'm going to pinch that and use that from now on. Uh, but you don't want to hear from me. We already have uh, one question. Um, others are welcome. We probably have three or four minutes um, before I need to hand Cam. Uh, so the first question is, you <clears throat> had some quotes up there from your work uh, out at Birchip, um, and they're all from blokes. So this question is, <laughs> how do women feel about resilience? How do they uh, describe it? Mm. Yes, well, there were uh, some very gendered elements uh, to, uh, to that work. Um, look, you know, we, we weren't able... The, the numbers weren't that we were able to sort of like necessarily do a, a gender split. But what I would say is that um, some of the more striking uh, kind of perspectives that came from the farm women that we spoke to were actually about this politics of resilience. So it was about who, um, it's in the politics of resilience as it relates to certain kind of social norms and expectations. And I think some of the farm women were able to be and um, spoke up about being um, particularly critical of quite stifling notions of resilience uh, and wanting to ask those hard questions. And I don't doubt that perhaps some of those uh, blokes that I quoted there probably had um, smart women uh, behind them actually prompting them to think about the need to just jump up again and throw the crop in again and mm. extend the credit again, and mm. et cetera. Mm. But to actually start asking them questions about, well, what are the alternatives here? What mm. can we do? Mm. And some of the really interesting um, kind of adaptations that we identified with that work were incredibly innovative and were completely reliant on a highly complicated um, farm family arrangement and all sorts of different configurations. I'm sure you could all appreciate that, you know, in terms of, for example, relocating the farm family to a large uh, regional city in order to um, meet the needs of children, uh, and the partner in the family, and then the farmer becomes more the kind of drive-in, drive-out farmer. Mm. Those sorts of approaches, you know, and other sorts of innovations around, you know, in all sorts of complicated uh, housing arrangements and, and things in order to work multiple jobs, etc., were, as I said, very much a, a family decision and were very creative responses, I think, um, partly because uh, of the women's kind of encouragement and perhaps mm -hmm. social uh, license mm -hmm. to think a bit differently. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna give this a couple more minutes. I don't wanna go over time, but I do wanna get a couple more. Um, Carolyn's. 
and Caroline Welch, speaking of, of yeah, um, talking of BCG, a, a really <laughs> strong good women, a re- yeah, and, smart yeah, women. Really, there we go. Yeah, and a really good question, um, and one that I've actually um, come across. This COVID nineteen has really woken us up, I think, to this to this one, and that is that resilience requires a capacity, some sort of slack in the system to respond to to shocks and and uh, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Uh, and, but our current systems, economic, uh, business and social, are just in time, minimal cost, mm-hmm. everything's tight, you know, so to maximise profit margins. So how do, we, how do we create some slack without losing profitability and performance? Mm-hmm. It'll be that. Well, I mean, I'd love to hear from other people about this, um, including yeah. Pam. But, um, I mean, just a couple of quick reflections. One is that I think part of it is recognizing the need for versatility in our resilience models or versatility in our kind of success models if you like so i think undoubtedly there will be um you know still a room for optimization if you like certainly you know (laughs) our maybe veterinary kind of you know um approaches you know you want some uh there there is still space for it but it's actually recognizing that that model which we've just rolled out just you know scaled out across all decision making Mm. all systems all sectors actually is highly inappropriate in in some of those areas Mm. and particularly when we start to connect the dots down those value chains and supply chains and stuff and just realize just take one break in that system there's no redundancy and then you know so i think um I think that's one thing is just that kind of being a little bit more versatile about it. The other one is about being critical of the time scales over which we make things. So a lot of our problem solving and um, business management approaches are very, very habitual in terms of the time scales. You know, the notion of quarters, you know, working a quarter, like that's invented, like we've invented that. And yet it's such a stifling kind of thing. You know, we've got to... Likewise, you know, when you look at the way um, banks make decisions around giving credit, for example, still the timelines over which they will look at that um, performance and make that decision are very, very short. Now, if they were to extend that timeline and actually start to reward those who may not get the highs, but are avoiding the lows, those who are consistently performing and building up natural capital, the, the wealth of their farm in other ways, you actually might see that there's quite big significant shifts in which farms are supported. So, I mean, this is stuff you'd know better than me, Carolyn, but it's a very good question for discussion. That's a really good example. Thank you for that. Uh, We have some other questions coming in, but um, folks, I do want to move to Cam. So I'm going to try to attend to some of those questions after Cam's talk. Uh, So let me introduce Cam properly now. Um, Well, I have. So... Cam, it's over to you. Talk to us about decision making in a crisis. <laughs> Thank you, Corey. It's an unusual right. introduction. Um, yeah. Well, first <laughs> of all, thank, thanks for the invitation. I was actually delighted to to get it, and um, I think what um, uh, what the organisation's trying to do is really uh, incredibly positive. Um, the first slide that I've put up there is. Um, one of my wife and I, we farmers, as Corey said on the introduction. And so what I want to share with you in this presentation is a little bit about what I do as a farm consultant to try and help um, resilience in farming businesses. But it's also something we adopt at home. Um, I don't believe that you can run any of these sort of systems and talk about them unless you actually you know, experience them yourself and try and put them into practice because that's where you really learn the um, what works and what doesn't work. Um, And so what I want to do in the presentation is actually share an example. I've got a lot of them, but I want to share an example of a farmer who was uh, recognising the impacts of climate change and wanted to do something to try and um, build greater resilience into his farming business. And it's an example I'll show you um, uh, towards the end. I've got a couple of logos uh, down there, or three logos down there. So what I'm actually talking about is really been a work in progress, I suppose, over the last 15 or 20 years. First of all, through the Grain and Graze program, which is a mixed farming program that I was involved with, and also currently with stuff with Southern Farming Systems and the National Land Care Program, um, where this work sort of been evolving from. Uh, I want to start off with a, a comment and then a question to you. 
And the first one I came to, I was doing a road trip for the GRDC over in Western Australia and I was talking about farm decision making. And the farmer piped up and said, just because we make decisions all the time doesn't mean we're good at making them. And that really got me thinking. And so the question I pose to you is when we are taught to make a good decision? Because I believe, and Fiona and I have come to the conclusion that a really important part of our resilience in our farming business, and in fact, in our consulting business as well, is our ability to make good decisions at the right time. And the more of those we can make, the more resilient we believe we come as a business. Um, and so while you're gonna have these shocks and these ups and downs, our decision-making and timely decision-making um, is pretty critical. You know, when, you, when I ask the question, when were you taught to make a good decision? I can remember I was taught when to read, to write. I had 12 years at school and then did more at university and whatever else. I don't remember 12 or 15 years of every year being taught how to progressively get better at making a good decision. But in farming, they're so critical because we've got to make these decisions before the dice is rolled and then we see the outcome at the end of them. So to me, unless we've, we become very good and very comfortable with our decision making, then I think it's an aspect of resilience in a business that we're missing out on. So I'm going to take you through a little bit on that. Um, to start by just um, reflecting on a few things I've learnt about what I see as good decision makers in the 30 years that I've been consulting um, and consulting. The first one is what influences a decision. And I've come to the conclusion in simple terms, your decisions are influenced by your head, by your heart and by your gut. The head meaning the, if you like, the facts and figures, the analytical, the analysis type stuff that we can do. A lot of science is built on that. A lot of agricultural science is built on that. But I've learned that two other aspects really influence some of these complex and more critical decisions. The second one being the heart. So they're your values, your beliefs, your preferences, uh, your biases that you've got. These are the things that you believe in and you're willing to defend. And quite often I hear people saying, don't talk about that, just stick to the facts. Well, the bottom line is in decision making, you can't always stick to the facts because a lot of these have a emotional or a heart element associated with it as well. And the third part of it is the gut. And to me, the gut is that um, your intuition and your past experiences in there. And a lot of farmers make decisions based on their gut experienced something before, have seen the outcome, use that very much to inform their, their next decision. So importantly for me as a, a, a scientist and as an advisor coming in, I had to move away from just wanting to hammer the head or hammer the facts and start to recognise and try and meld together the head, heart and, and gut in that uh, decision making. A couple of other things I've learned about good decision making. Commonly, there are many factors we've got to weigh up. It's pretty rare in decisions we make in farming, because most of them have a degree of complexity, some really complex, that there's only one factor that we've got to consider. There are multiple factors that we need to consider and need to weigh up. And importantly, they're not all, always of equal importance. There are some pros on one side of it, there are cons on the other side. And it's how you strike that balance that we've really got to work towards and, and um, um, I suppose, surface. And so this idea of how do you balance up those pros and cons? Because to me, a good decision and good decision making is one that is made on balance. This is the way we should go. Rarely does everything stack up the right way. Um, it's always some sort of a compromise, just how much of a compromise do you actually need to make? And finally, you think differently about a decision as the risk or the odds change. So if there was a 90% chance of getting a good result, as opposed to a 10% chance of getting a good result, I would think and make a different decision based on those odds and based on that risk. So I need that understanding as well if I'm gonna make a good decision. And when I look around agriculture and the information we've got out there, there's a lot of information, but not necessarily a lot of good information that tells you around the risk or the odds of those different decisions happening. Well, agriculture is full of average values. How often do we get average values in farming? We don't, you know, <laughs> they're the most rare is the average. We either get higher or lower than that, but somehow we're meant to do that based on averages. Banks want stuff based on averages. It's just a nonsense, but anyway, I'll move on. Um, so how do you bring those few thoughts together? 
So what we really want is a decision process that includes the head, heart and gut. It incorporates risk and risk is very much a personal thing. What I think is a high level of risk and I wouldn't want to take it, someone else mightn't care about that and would be willing to take the punt. We've got to weigh up these multiple factors that I referred to that may not all be of equal importance. And we've got to balance, and this is a really important one, balance timeliness against time to think. And I don't know if many people have heard of a fellow by the name of Daniel Kahneman. Um, he's done some fabulous work on this. He's a professor at Princeton University. He won a Nobel Prize for his work in this. And in a nutshell, his work is about there needs to be, we need to spend more time just taking a step back and thinking, which I think ties in a lot to what Lauren was saying in some of those decisions, why do we just keep doing the same thing over and over again, is to spend that bit of time just to take a step back. Having said that, sometimes good opportunities go if you spend too long thinking. So how do we balance up timeliness against this time to think? And what I'd like to do is show you an example. And I first saw this from this fella here. Um, this is Barry Mudge. He's a farmer in South Australia. He farms north of Port Germain and their family have been there uh, five generations in pretty marginal cropping country. And they're a very profitable farming business in an area that for a lot of people would think that's too tough, too hard to make a living on. One of Barry's biggest decisions each year is um, how much crop they sow. Because just because they have X many thousand hectares doesn't mean every year they sow X many thousand hectares. And I saw this for the first time from Barry and I've, I've developed that sort of, um, that concept a little bit further, which I'm going to share with you. And the example I'm going to show you was a farmer. I got a phone call from this farmer and I was driving along one time. He's a cropping and livestock trading farmer. He's south of Black, uh, Ballarat. He's one of the farmers I work with, a client of mine, um, in about a 550 mil rainfall zone. And he was looking at ways to manage their risk on their business, husband and wife business for three boys at school, wanting all to come back farming. Um, and he was a, a, a primarily a cropper with all the, the land in one location. And he wanted to think about, or help, he wanted me to help him think about potentially selling some cropping land and buying some retired dairy country further south, which was 900 mil rainfall. Because he was, he was reflecting himself of how, as the climate was changing, cropping in the environment he's currently farming in was going to be a bit more difficult. Now, to me, that's a pretty big decision. You know, he spent the last 30 years building up this cropping business, and now he wants to sell off a few thousand acres and potentially buy dairy country. So how do you work through a decision like that? So the steps I, you know, we worked through was, first of all, we defined the decision. And in this case, you know, it's got to be clear. And I see quite often when people are trying to make decisions, they don't actually know or have clarity around the decision they want to make. In this case here, it was, do we sell cropping country to buy dairy country? Then I said to him, you and your wife, Paula, just sit down and work out what do you see are the major considerations that you think should influence this decision? And they came up with eight of them. And I'm not going to go through all of them with you, but the first thing was just a brainstorm. It took them about five or ten minutes. And they were things around um, impact on debt. Um, could it assist their livestock trading enterprise? Could they run sheep? Um, if they bought a dairy farm down there, could it be operated remotely? And I think the last one's a, a pretty important one if you look at it, the degree of challenge. One thing this farmer said is, I like a challenge all the time. I get bored once I get things worked out. I can't keep repeating and doing the same thing. So he actually had, they had eight major considerations that they came up with. In this brainstorm, only took them a, you know, a short while, but that's what they said. All of those things should be considered in making this decision. I then said to them, for each of them, take them in turn and think at what point would you think differently about your response to each of those critical considerations? And I call these my tipping points. There's a point in any decision when you decide, no, nope, I'm going to jump this way or I'm going to jump that way. So somewhere there is a description or a value that um, uh, you'll change on. And so if we look at the one on debt, I said, what would be the most favourable um, point where you'd think really positively about your impact on debt. And he said, well, if I could make this change and it would reduce debt. And I said, what would be the worst possible outcome? 
if I made this change and it actually increased our debt because we've got a fair bit of debt at the moment. And so we ended up with these two points, reduced debt as one possibility, increased debt as another possibility. And then I said, is there anything in between? He said, yeah, we could swap over without it having any impact on debt. So there were three points in there where he would think differently about that decision. And we just went through all eight of them. Some of them fairly simple. Um, if you go in here, ability to run sheep as an example, they were just yes, no answers. Could I do it? Yes, I could. No, I couldn't. Um, didn't have to think too hard about it. We just needed to be able to make that assessment. Once we'd created this, I then got them to sit down and say, I want you to um, think about these scores, but relative to each other. So in other words, of these eight that we've got here, are some of them you think should have more emphasis in your decision than others? And that's how we ended up with this scoring system where you can see some of them here get a score of eight as the most positive, but for another consideration, it's only got a score of four. So they rated them as being half as important as um, some of the other ones. And you'll see they've all got different um, scores according to how they, they rated them. Okay, so far this has taken us probably about 45 minutes to get to that point. We then end up with decision um, scores or decision descriptions and scores. So we add up to a maximum score, which in this case, if everything went right, it'd be 43 and a minimum score of zero if everything went wrong. And there are a few hints in how you build this and I'm whizzing through it pretty quickly, but I do actually have a explanation sheet of how you put these sort of things together. Um, and so what I got them to do was just say, if I read all of these conditions out to you and they were all favorable. So if we made this change, we would reduce debt. The capital of the land that we bought would appreciate quickly. The current land that we've got has hit its current productive limits. Um, it's becoming harder to lease land and so on. So if all of those things were favorable, what decision would you guys make? And they said, oh, it's a no brainer. We'd sell and we'd buy a dairy country. And then I did the reverse and said, if all of those things were bad and they were all getting zero scores, what decision would you make? And they said, we wouldn't sell, we'd keep with what we've got. And so that allowed us just to have two very simple decision points. We'd sell the cropping ground to buy dairy country or we'd stay as it is. And there's a little bit of um, toing and froing to get that score. But what it allowed them to do was then, before they've made the decision, go through and assess some dairy country and give them the scores based on that matrix that they'd put together. Um, and on the basis of it, to cut a long story short, the score was about 34 or 35, and they ended up buying some dairy country and they sold their, their cropping country. I speak to them now, because I actually use this as an example. I do some lecturing at Marcus Oldham, the Farm Management College. This is an example as we teach the students this decision-making process. And Troy comes on each year and he just says, it's the best decision I've ever made. He said it was just so clear and it's worked out really well. So how does this build farm resilience? First thing it does is it slows down your thinking. And slowing down your thinking in this case here is about an hour, hour and a quarter. Not days, not weeks, not months, just an hour or so just to step back. Secondly, it makes it transparent so others can contribute and follow. I could have some discussion, some input into that as well, ask questions around it as well. Other people in the business can do that as well. It also narrows down what information you want and the skills you need because you've only got to answer those questions. Uh, and quite often in agriculture, we're bombarded with information that really doesn't help our decision making at all. Importantly, it combines your head, heart and gut. As I spoke about, if you look at some of those critical factors, they had nothing to do with dollars and cents and calculations. They were about challenges. They were about how people felt. Um, and finally, it enables a level of risk that you want to take on to be included as well. Because if you want to be more risk averse, your score before you made that change in your decision would be different to the 29 that was included in that score that was there. And I'll just finish off, Corey, by just saying how this builds resilience on our farm. Uh, we've got a number of these that we've created that link to different times of the year and help to inform our decisions. So Fiona and I have created these over the last um, two or three years at critical points in the decision-making cycle. Things like, we've got one, do we need to grow more feed for winter? This is one we pull out every uh, 30th of May 
So at the end of May each year, don't care what the autumn break's been like, 30th of May, this decision matrix comes out. We go through it and we make a decision at the end of May about what we're gonna do about potentially increasing winter feed. Do we need to adjust stock numbers to carry through spring and summer? We make this decision at the end of August. So about now we're making that decision, believe it or not, of whether we think we're gonna be able to carry through in summer. Do we remove weeds from paddock? Quite a specific one. Um, I've had one paddock that I've, well, paddocks that I've able to spray this year. For the last four years, I haven't because we needed the feed and animals weren't in the right condition and so on. Um, do we apply more nitrogen in favourable springs? Because if we get a good year, before we used to say, isn't it a great spring? Now we say, it's a great spring. Let's maximise it and make the most out of it we possibly can because we're going to need to put it away for the bad years. And the last point there is just develop them when you're not under stress and implement them when you are. Uh, and that's probably the best advice I can give. If we can start building some of these and have them sitting there ready to go when we get into that situation, they're much easier to do and much more valuable than when you're under stress and you're trying to think through that process. So in summary, decision making is a skill. You can teach it, you can practice it, you can become much better at it. And I reckon the decision matrix a useful way of combining those things together. A um, couple of resources that I'll just put there, they're both on the Grain and Graze website. One was a booklet I was involved with called Farm Decision Making. And the second one is just a written guide of how to develop a decision matrix. And on that note, Corey, I'll call it quits. Thank you. Oh, no, don't, no, no quitting just yet. Good on you, Cam. That was wonderful. And um, uh, really good. I could have listened uh, more on that. Um, and, and you know that um, before I hand to questions, um, I think the realisation and Kahneman's work and others' work on this uh, has been really pivotal. Uh, the understanding that we, we as human beings, as, as naked apes, we think slow and we think fast and we have both, but 95% of the time we're thinking fast and that works 95% of the time. And that's that's running through and percolating through all sorts of fields, not just farming, but um, I've worked for physicians at very high levels and they're looking at how to improve, how to slow down decision-making and thinking and de-bias it um, in, in hospital settings so they give better care to people. So this is happening right across the board and it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a good thing, it's a good thing. And I, that was really practical and really useful. Righto. So, uh, so we do have a little time for questions. Um, some wonderful comments coming through about your presentations, folks. Um, we've got to finish up in about five or six minutes. But do we have any questions for Cam? Otherwise, I might just ask. A lot of good comments coming through, Cam. <laughs> so you've wowed them. <laughs> That's really good. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll ask, um, I'll pick one of the earlier questions and put it to you both. Um, one of them, one of the comments and the question was that there's a tendency, this person says, there's a tendency uh, to think of Australian uh, rural communities and farmers in the context of a wealthy nation, that we're a wealthy nation and therefore we kind of overlook um, the need to build resilience. So how do we, how do we overcome that? Anybody? Uh, Lauren can <laughs> take that first. Take it up for? <laughs> I mean, the, some of the some of the comments that you both, the issues and the and the advice that you've both been giving, um, really applies as much in a developing country situation. And you know, I've seen similar similar strategies used in those situations. And having worked in developing countries, you know, a lot of the a lot of the same problems affect, afflict farmers there as they do mm. here. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with the comment, the question. Um, and I think one of the uh, benefits of the Sustainable Development Goals, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with those, um, is that they try to actually go beyond the national scale of kind of categorising and ranking countries according to their development level, which tends to that sort of idea of wealthy nations, they're fine. And you get the same thing with climate change and you know, adaptation. Well, you guys are fine, uh, et cetera, to understanding the variability at the sub-national scale. Um, and then also understanding how interconnected it is. So the national kind of buckets don't even really make a whole lot of sense you know, in a lot of ways as well, just because we have such a globalised, internationalised agricultural sector. 